I think 1965, Terry Jones and I um, had come down from Oxford. We'd done a lot of review acting at Oxford, which meant writing and performing a material. And we came down, Terry, as always, Terry had come down a year before me and was working at the BBC um, doing a sort of script uh, writing for various LE shows like uh, Billy Cotton's band show, Russ Conway, when they wanted a few jokes as people leant over the piano and had a few a bit of banter. You know, again, the Costa Brava, no Costa Fiver, or, or terrible things like that. <laughs> Terry would have to write these. Um, so I used to go and work with him at the BBC, and we would, um, we would try and sort of um, manufacture something of our own. And then we did a series called Do Not Adjust Your Set, produced by Humphrey Barclay, with David Jason, Denise Coffey, and Eric Idle. And that was great, because it was doing what we really enjoy, writing and performing our material. And then Frank Muir took over at London Weekend Television and said, we need a new series. And we came up with this idea of a series about history, which would be from the point of view that the history was, there was television around, there was broadcasting around during um, these periods. So that, that, that was the idea. And, and some of it worked, and some of it didn't work. Um, I think, th Excuse me. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's a critic. That was what. Yeah. <laughs> That was what the, uh, the you know the, the 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 channel chief said when he <laughs> came to renewing the second series. Uh, what did happen was that, um, as I say, John John Cleese rang me up in, in April 1969. and said, "I've just seen um, the complete not a history series you did with Terry," and I was quite touched by that because John was a bit of a you know he was he was quite a star at the time. So well, John, that's very nice. Said. You won't be doing any more of those, will you? <laughs> I said, that's John, as I remember him. Um, but then he said, why don't we, you know, I quite like what you were doing, and I, you know, why don't we get together? And we did the 48 show, and we'd like to work with you on it. That, and that's how Python sort of began, really, from that, from that phone call. And I'm glad to say that there was quite a lot of history in Python in the end, bastard history, especially the uh, Holy Grail, which had all sorts of specious um, history nonsense in it. So we were, we, were, we were able to carry on with the thread of history um, beyond that series. But looking back at it now, I have to say, <clears throat> I think there's some things which still remain quite funny. The, the Pythons are sort of the uh, Beatles of comedy for many people. Is that a ridiculous exaggeration or does it sometimes feel that way to you? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a it's the most amazing compliment if it's really meant, because... Well, it is on my people, part. I just wonder whether well, it feels <laughs> that way from, from people's reactions to you. Um, well, in a way that people know all the songs of the Beatles, a lot of people know all the sketches of the Pythons. And also, I think there's that feeling um, somehow that Python worked very well for musicians. A lot of pop groups, a lot of musicians on the road took Python with them, showed Monty Python, and there was something which they responded to as well. So I think it's a kind of like, it's like a response to music and, and um, the Python stuff. There's only one way, you know, the, the versions of the particular sketches were like versions of songs. Um, but, but the odd thing was that the Beatles actually split up on the day that Python's first show went out, in October 1969. But as I say, we did, that, I mean, Terry Jones and I were, were, were such enormous fans that whenever a, a, a Beatles record came out, we'd be writing down at Terry's. We'd stop work for the day and get the, the album, whatever it was, the White Album or Sgt. Pepper, and just listen to it religiously for the entire day, going through the words, what does this mean, what does all that mean? And they were gods, like they were to most people at that time, and, and their, their, their success was absolutely extraordinary. So to find later on that we... We, we struck up a rapport, certainly with George, and also Paul was keen on on, um, uh, on Python. It was just something you know you don't, you don't expect to happen. Mm. And in terms of people's reaction in your diaries, uh, at one stage you uh, complained that some people were being too reverential about Python. What did that mean to you? Uh, well, I mean, I, I think that that Python evolved. Python appreciation evolved over the years. And originally, Python was just a, a pretty scrappy little show, um, which was very subversive in its intent. And we didn't want anyone to take anything too seriously. Um, and everyone, everything was up for grabs. So when people started to refer to Python as iconic or legendary, 
I mean, that didn't seem a very Pythonic thing to be, <laughs> but there's nothing you could do about it. That's it, except sit back and hope you make some money out of it. So, I mean, we were, we were quite happy with it. But uh, I think that's what I meant by reverential. There was a sort of feeling that, that um, this was the sacred text um, and all that, which seemed at odds with what we did to start with. But as I say, it was just a speculative little show that made the six of us laugh. And now the very fact that people all over the world, you know, are saying, nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. You know, and I remember writing that about that three o'clock in the morning to try and get out of a sketch which didn't go anywhere. I mean, why does that particular thing suddenly become, you know, um, I say, a text? But it does. And so now we've given up criticizing anybody who is um, who is too reverential. We encourage them, we like them, we want them to come to our concerts and buy all our merchandise and our mugs and our t-shirts and all that and, and generally treat us as gods. That's fine with us. <laughs> Trouble is we've got all gone a bit seedy by now. <laughs> Delinquent gods. Can I ask you a little about acting and your process, if that's not too mm -hmm. grand a word? How did you learn how to be such a good actor? <laughs> well, you don't learn how to be a good actor. You learn, I suppose, how to act. And, uh, and uh, you learn... You are it. a good actor. Oh, well, well, thank you, yes. Yeah, well, that's nice of you to say so, but... Uh, a lot I of people say so. Okay, yeah. Uh, <laughs> take the compliment. All right, I'll take it, but, whoa, <laughs> you know, there's so many great actors around. Who I didn't say you were great. Better. No, okay. <laughs> no. What did you say? Good. You said you were good. Good. Oh, well, that's what... I'll settle for good, Eddie. That's all right. Um, <laughs> you know whether you can act or not by the reaction that you get to whatever you're doing. And, and I remember the first time I, I really was aware of acting, and I wasn't reacting as such, was when I was at school. I was about nine or ten years old, and I used to be... I was able to impersonate the masters and teachers and all that at school and that was um, that was very useful and you could do I, I used to do little sketches at breaks about the various you know with the little room where they've served the milk the milk room it was called where people had milk at the break and I would then do a little improvised 10 minute session there making it all up and, and usually involving all the various teachers and people thought if you could do their voices it was just hilarious so I realized then that I could make people laugh and, um, and that's, I mean, I think that's what acting is. That's when you know you're an actor. It's, a, it's an act of observation. It's looking around. It's looking at, I mean, what I used to do in class, other people would be working hard. And I'd be looking at the teacher. And I became fascinated by their little twitches and things they did and the way they pulled their tie up and the way their trousers were. And all that. I thought, fascinating. So it's an act of observation. And if you could bring those details back, people suddenly said, hey, that's really good. He can be Mr. Tucker brilliantly, yeah, or whatever. So that's where it first came. Mm. But going on to quote-unquote serious acting, and again in your diaries, particularly around GBH, uh, you had the self-doubt, you wondered whether you were up to it and yeah. whether this was a part yeah. you could do. Yeah. Well, the, the GBH was an interesting case in point because it was um, written by Alan Bleasdale. And, Alan had and you do a very good Alan Bleasdale. I'll do, I'll do later, later. Okay. Uh, <laughs> later. <laughs> that sort of register. Oh, God. <laughs> terrible. Um, that was on a good day. Um, that wasn't Alan. That was, that was Mr. Tucker at school. Um, <laughs> guess what we called him. Um, <laughs> Um, Alan, had, 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 Alan had form as a, he, was a, he'd done these marvellous series like Boys from the Black Stuff, um, which were all set in Liverpool. And uh, so, and he was very much a northern writer using northern actors. And they had a marvellous group of actors uh, that he called upon each time. And I just look at those and I, I admired the work so much. I suddenly to get a call from Alan to say, would I be in his latest series about Liverpool? Um, of course, I was enormously pleased that he'd asked me. But then you immediately start thinking, why me? You know, why, why not all these lovely Liverpudlian actors he has? Why did he get someone, um, you know, up from London to be a Liverpudlian? And uh, so that, that was part of the, my, my nervousness about accepting the role. But I knew it was, I knew it was a great part. 
and you just got to find out whether you've really got that in you. I mean, I, I, I did lots of comedy sketches. That was most of my acting, really. I'd done very, very few long dramas at all. Um, I'd been in Three Men in a Boat with Stephen Frears, um, but that was like doing a series of comedy sketches. And I, I, I knew I could do lots of different characters. Like in Python, you'd have to play 10 or 15 different characters in the film and all that. So I, I could do that. But this was a sustained character with a storyline going through. And in quite a serious situation. And also the <laughs> character, Jim Nelson, I played, was actually based on Alan himself, who has an amazing number of neuroses, <laughs> including being unable to travel over bridges. <laughs> He can't. It's very, very complicated for him to go anywhere out of Liverpool <laughs> because the Runcorn Bridge is the one way out. So he has to go miles out to go by Sunderland to, to get out of Liverpool. Uh, and, you know, he, he would say, this is, this is me, you know, you're doing me, but you're doing you doing me and all that sort of thing. That, that, so it was quite personal and all that. But it was a good experience in the end. I mean, John Cleese talked about how, and you mentioned the silly Python characters, but how you become the characters. He said that everybody else is, is, is larking around, but, he, but every single character, mm. you become it. And Alan Bleasdale said of you, weary as Michael Palin might be of hearing this, he is an inherently and instinctively decent person, very bright, very funny, and a remarkable actor. He said, so many roles where you clearly meant not to believe in a character that he's playing, somehow in GBH, without ever having trained as a method actor, he just became that man. God, where did you get that from? <laughs> that's really good. <laughs> I'll have a copy of that. No, well, that's very nice to know. I do, I, I like to have it, I like playing characters. And that was what I tended to do in Python. Um, I think probably because it goes right back to early, you know, playing teachers at school. Um, I got rather bored playing the same person all the time. I'm fascinated by the diversity of people and the way people can be different. And also making a character convincing. I mean, you know, um, Pontius Pilate, I remember writing that, you know, and Romans, you know, you, you ragged ruffians and all that, you know. <laughs> and I realized that if you just do it, for the jokes of wagged wuffians, it looks, it's not going to work. So he's got to be someone who's completely and absolutely, totally committed to what he's saying, you know, which is the, the exercise of power in this part of the world, you know, and that's what, what he talks about. He also says he ranks higher than any in Rome. <laughs> but he has to believe that he's saying he ranks higher than any in Rome. <laughs> he can't understand why he says he ranks higher than any in Rome. People are laughing. And, so you've got, I, I, I like that, being able to... <laughs> being able to convince people. I mean, the, the Spanish Inquisition character was, it was just... It's, a, it's not much of a character. It's just someone comes on then can't remember why he's there. <laughs> <laughs> Has to keep going off again. No, I'll come in again, I'll come in again. Yeah, yeah, OK. Uh, four, four points. Yeah. The worst kind of acting, but he absolutely believes in it. And he's got all the gear on, and he looks like a cardinal and all that. So making something out of, making a real character out of something that seems rather sort of ephemeral is, is it does attract me, yeah, well, yeah. There's a couple more questions from Radio Times readers. Uh, Richard Davis in Retford, where he says you used to go train spotting. Some years ago, I recall Michael Palin being quoted as saying he would not want a railway locomotive named after him. However, there are two such diesel trains. Anglia Railways Class 153 Super Sprinter Number 153335 and Virgin Trains Class 221 Super Voyager Number 221130. Did he change his mind? If not, were they named without his knowledge? Yeah. I, it's very hard to stop people naming the train <laughs> once they want to. The, the train that still carries my name is the one on the low, lowest off line, and it's called, uh, it was, it's sort of Anglian. Heroes of Anglia, the Anglian region. And I don't know where they got me from. My, my parents retired to Southwold. That was, all, that was all. Why that qualified me to be there, along with Heroin the Wake <laughs> and Delia Smith <laughs> and Alf Ramsey, you know, I mean, I felt this as I was, I honestly felt I, I wasn't worthy of that. Um, and I never, I always hoped I'd get on my train, but I never did. And I had to usually sit in Delia Smith. <laughs> and then I'd catch the train. <laughs> Let's get into our audience then. You've uh, 
listen very patiently. We've got microphones everywhere, so if you raise your hand, we'll uh, get a microphone to you. Um, what about up at the back? Yes. Do you find it tiresome or a burden wearing the mantle of national treasure, or does it give you licence to get away with things that we wouldn't guess that you would do? Which of us is this question for? <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, exactly what are you referring to? <laughs> I have never had a, gone on a date with anybody and said, no, either, I'm a national treasure. What do you do? You're a national treasure. Nor do I go into the post office and say, excuse me, I'm a national treasure. Can I go to the front of the queue? Um, so it's an odd, it's a very odd thing. And national treasures are added by the day, you know. So Judy Dench and Alan Bennett were all being put in boxes. I always think about national treasure should actually be in some glass box to be sort of seen and touched. And I have to say, funny enough, you should mention that, I was always rather miffed that the Pythons were never Madame Tussauds. Now, that would have been national treasure ship. I'd love to see John Cleese in wax, wouldn't you? <laughs> that means he'd use up all the available wax. There wouldn't be any, any left for Terry Jones, the smaller ones. But um, no, but, yeah. How is Terry, by the way? Well, you know, Terry's got dementia, and um, as most people know, and he's he's... He's healthy, sprightly, quite strong, but has really lost the power of communication. Uh, <clears throat> which is very, very sad for someone who lived by words and arguments and debates and mischief and all that sort of stuff. So he finds it very, he just can't, he, well, he's lost, lost the power to get anything, a sentence out and all that. But I see him regularly and I don't know with this kind of dementia what goes into people and what's, what they're taking in and what they're not taking in. I always assume that they're taking more in than you think they're taking in. So we just go out and go to the pub. He likes going to the pub. We have a pint. I ramble on about stuff and occasionally he laughs. And, and so I think like something, old times. something must be, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 he never laughed before. 